Thank you very much. Um, congratulations to the honorary members. Um, I, I do feel quite humble uh, standing here talking about plastic in front of you two, uh, so I apologize in advance. Um, I, I'm here because um, I, I know some of the people who helped organize the meeting. Uh, I've cycled a lot with Vanessa Hodgetts uh, and with Jude's husband. And, uh, and, and I'm round and about in Sheffield. It's not the first time I've talked in this hall. I was hoping that you'd be an easier audience to talk to. It's not good talking to cutlers about plastic. <laughs> and can, can you imagine these days going to a dinner party and say, someone saying, oh, what, and what do you do for a living? Oh, well, I'm a plastics professor. Have been for 40 years. Yeah. Because plastic's about as fashionable as smoking. <laughs> Right? Um, it really, really is terrible. Everyone wants to be plastic free. Uh, and basically, I'm, I'm here to talk to you. I'm, the, you know, I'm obviously the, the pre-dinner entertainment. But, um, but I'm here to talk to you seriously uh, about plastic, uh, about its benefits and its drawbacks, and what you might be able to do uh, in the way that you practice uh, that could make uh, for a better use of plastic. David Attenborough is one of my heroes. Uh, I did the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures in 2002, um, pretty much about plastics, and uh, got to meet David Attenborough on a number of occasions, and then he did this to me. <laughs> the Blue Planet. Uh, all those seals swimming with plastic bags on their heads, um, baby chicks with um, <clears throat> earbuds stuck in the throat, and it, it really was a piece of communication that transformed what was an ignored but burgeoning question and made it so timely. So the power of communication around these issues is really, really important. And as a polymer scientist, as, as, as someone who, who studies plastic, um, who, who understands the properties of the materials, and thinks that they've brought great benefit to mankind, there's clearly a challenge. There is a real and present problem. Um, there are lots of public and political misconceptions. I was at a meeting yesterday uh, with people from DEFRA who were talking about um, the transformation of plastic bottles and cups into things that were biodegradable or digestible. And I'll point out to you that that's actually a really dumb thing to do. Um, so I want to communicate the benefits of plastic. I want us to understand why we are where we are. Um, have a look at some of the vested interests and how having money as the only metric makes a mess. Um, so at the University of Sheffield, we're, about, we're doing research to evidence the appropriate policy and regulation. Uh, and I have a team of 37 academics uh, engaged in a grant, uh, in, a, in a big research proposal funded by a grant called Redefining Single Use. Uh, and, and towards the end, I'll tell you something about that. So this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, it was first published in the Daily Mail, uh, not a journal I read very often, but it, it does make for great examples. Um, so there's a, there's a surfer because it's nearly always surfers who are making a noise about plastic, uh, on the Maldives. Um, and this is a beach, a beach that faces the prevailing wind, and all of that plastic has blown in onto the beach. Um, she's clearly disgusted, and is looking in disgust at the beach. The Daily Mail didn't point out that she's carrying a surfboard made from glass-reinforced polyester resin that has an internal core of polyurethane foam. Nor did it point out that she has some lovely uh, Lycra leggings on um, and, uh, and a dry fit uh, polyester shirt. And that carefully coiffed hair yeah, contains quite a bit of product. And that's also plastic. So we need to make sure that we're not distracted by the convenient truth of a beach full of irresponsible people's waste that just happens to be made of plastic. 
And we need to balance that against the health and environmental costs of the materials we need to use in our everyday lives, and in your case, the materials you need to use to save lives. So now to, a, now to a, a, an organ I do respect, The Guardian. So here's the headline. A million bottles a minute, the world's plastics binge as dangerous as climate change. Bullshit. Complete and utter. Right? So this is the kind of photograph that illustrates these things. Uh, these ladies are in Bangladesh. Uh, they're, so they're sorting somebody else's waste into coloured and clear PET because coloured PET has about a third of the value of clear PET. Clear PET you can recycle very easily. And this is the convenient truth we shouldn't be distracted by because only 4% of oil and gas is turned into plastic. Another 3% is consumed by the Harbour Bosch process that makes fertiliser by taking nitrogen out of the air and making ammonia and then ammonium nitrate. That's 7% of world oil and gas. Medicines, tiny proportion. Home and personal care, cleaning products, another couple of percent, believe it or not. But 87% of oil and gas is burned. Make CO2, which drives global warming. And if you live in a city and there's lots of diesel emissions, creates particulates that cause respiratory disease. That is the inconvenient truth that we don't want to deal with whilst we obsess about the 4% that makes things just look a little scruffy. From an ecological perspective, it's really not a big deal. So more from The Guardian. Okay. Um, this was yesterday. Um, I actually had some involvement in this. Uh, there's a company called Unpackaged uh, that we've been working with. So they've launched a packaging free trial. You take your own packaging and you take your own Tupperware, essentially, to the store fill your own bottles. It's on one store. It's in one store in Oxford. Um, this is good. It was responsibly reported. Um, and it's from the uh, consumer affairs correspondent. This headline, right, designed to frighten. People eat at least 50,000 plastic particles a year, study finds. How many diesel particles do you think you breathe in a day? Right? It's not quite Avogadro's number, but it's a number that's orders of magnitude bigger than this. And if you brush your teeth and don't rinse very well, you consume more than 50,000 titanium dioxide particles. Now, it does say further down in the article by the irresponsible Damien Carrington. I'm starting to sound like Donald Trump now, aren't I? <laughs> OK. Um, I'm really not about fake news. Uh, so it does say uh, in the lower down in the article by the irresponsible Damien Carrington um, that there's no proof that ingesting plastic particles can cause you any harm whatsoever. There's no proof that they are absorbed by your body. And in fact, and you guys know all about ethical review. I, I tried to get an ethical re review for a, an experiment where um, at a conference dinner, half the people had chicken and sweet corn soup and half the people had chicken and small yellow particles of polyethylene soup. <laughs> okay? uh, and then there was a prize for someone who could tell the difference between the two the following day. <laughs> because as you know, a sensible, well-trained audience, your body rejects foreign particles. Your alimentary canal is essentially a tube, and things that aren't absorbed get rejected. So I'm really not worried 
about eating 50,000 plastic particles in a year. And I imagine that's an underestimate. But the headline is absolutely frightening. And he's driving perverse behavior. So part of my job, part of my job description is to call out greenwash and eco bollocks. Um, in fact, I teach a course in that for first year chemists. Okay? Um, where essentially what we do is, 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 as part of the course, take headlines from newspapers and unpack them scientifically. Right? Because it's a skill that every scientist should learn very, very early so that they aren't sucked in to worshipping crystals or homeopathy. So, in this example, how many of you have loads of these? Right? Loads of Hessian bags. I'm green, I'm green, I'm green. Yeah, a Daily Mail bag. I'm an eco bag and I'm proud of it. This is the one that tells the truth. <laughs> my other bag is in my SUV because actually the biggest car in the car park generally has the most eco bags in. And, <laughs> and if you follow the evidence, you have to take 127 polyethylene carrier bags to do more environmental damage than having one eco bag. Right? Ergo, if you use the carrier bag for more than one purpose, you have to use the eco bag 250 times to get ahead of taking a new carrier bag every time. Okay, so, so in my rucksack over there, I actually have, well, actually, you'll see it later. So, so the, single, the single issue campaigners kind of focus on things. So this is another surfers, right? So this is the Boomerang Alliance. So Australia, right? Loads of surfers. They're all really concerned about the amount of plastic we must act now. These are all very sensible things. Okay, um, and then down here, the, so there's a single plastic bottle can break down into 10,000 pieces of microplastic, arbitrary number, wouldn't stand up to any uh, analysis. <clears throat> 192 billion pieces of plastic, you know, all these numbers, and then there's this. Microplastics act as a toxic sponge one million times more toxic than the water around it. Really? Completely and utterly without evidence. Endocrine disruptors, drugs, plasticizers, will absolutely absorb onto hydrophobic materials. But at the concentrations in the sea, this really doesn't bear up to any analysis. So what is the real and present problem? Um, I collected these today on my way in. Thanks, Jude. Um, so reuse and recycling is difficult and expensive. And the really sad thing is it's always cheaper to make a new piece of packaging from virgin plastic than it is to make the same piece of packaging from recycled plastic. It actually costs more, right? Why are people doing it? Because it's the right thing to do. And we've ended up in the state we've got, because I'm sure you remember when you were swimming that you'd get a bottle of pop in a big glass bottle that would go back. When I was a kid growing up in not very nice part of Leeds, um, if I wanted spending money, I'd go root round under hedges, yeah, find a Corona bottle, take it back to the shop, get the deposit, buy some sweets. We got sold this, actually the lighter materials, PET bottles mean that there's less energy in transporting bottles around. True. 
Um, we got sold the idea that you could throw them away. Problem is, there is no away, right? The Earth's pretty much a closed system. But what actually happened, and you see this playing out more and more, is that the costs get pushed on someone else. So the consumer now pays the disposal costs. And it takes them away from the producer and the retailer. And ultimately, it takes them away from the individual consumer because the polluter does not pay. We all pay. And it's just the tragedy of the commons that the cheapest form of packaging and the most materially efficient form of packaging is also the most polluting form of packaging. Consequently, we have 8 billion tons of plastic in the Earth system. And if we continue at our current rate, there'll be 40 billion tons by 2050. 10 billion tons of that gets into the ocean every year. And another thing you'll hear is that very little of it comes from the UK, and that's true. Very little of it comes from Western Europe, and that's true. Very little of it comes from the USA, and that's true. Most of it comes from poor countries. Why? Because we, we exported the business model that generates profits, but we didn't export the waste collection infrastructure that goes with it. So that pollution that gets blamed on these countries generates profits back here, and we are ultimately responsible for it. So how does the 10 million tons get into the ocean? Well, it is literally thrown away and rolls downhill. Goes through the watercourses and gets in the sea. And there's about 3 billion tons of plastic scattered about the Earth's surface. Um, and there's about 5 billion tons that escapes um, landfills. And it's all eventually going to get into the sea. What does 8 billion tons look like? So 8 billion tons of plastic. Plastic has a density of about uh, 1 gram per cc, uh, a ton per cubic meter. So 8 billion cubic meters. Uh, 8 million cubic meters is 8 billion tons. And um, that's a cube that's got two kilometer sides. Uh, won't be a bad thing to put in Barnsley, I guess. It's, um, it's not actually a lot of material, right? Um, the problem is, it's not a big lump. It's made into things that are thin. So if you made it into cling film that's 13.2 microns thick, on a standard roll, you'd get to Pluto and back 140 times. Or, um, if you wrapped the Earth with it, you'd have about 25% to spare. You know, a bit like going to um, Pret-a-Manger and getting an apple that's wrapped in cling film. There's about 25% more cling film than there is area of apple, right? You could do the whole Earth. But the most frightening calculation I made was that in the last 50 years, we've made 8 billion tons of plastic, and that's more than all the people that have ever lived, right? Best estimate of all the people that have ever lived is 107 billion. Their average weight, 62 kilos. OK, 107 billion of me might get close to 8 billion tons, but and then the other frightening part of that calculation is that 7% of the people that have ever lived are alive today. 150,000 years of human history and 7% of them are alive today. And that's the problem. Because they're all consumers. So, that's why I've come to talk to you about a life without plastic. Um, there'd, be, uh, there'd be none of these. Okay. In this, 
How many different plastics do you think are in here? Six, okay. So that's, a, that's quite good. So the, the straps are nylon. The, the clasps are a different kind of nylon that you can't recycle together, okay? Um, the core's polystyrene. The shell's acrylonitrile butadiene. Um, and then there's, there's a foam, a polyurethane foam, that's covered with polyester. Right. Absolutely no way anyone could economically recycle this because of the way we design materials. There'd be no iPhone because all the electronics depends on insulators to work. There's, there's more plastic in an iPhone than there is silicon. Um, there'd be no medicines. Um, certainly no uh, cancer medicines, because they're always delivered by some fancy drug delivery system that has stealth vesicles and the like. Um, you wouldn't have much food, because the food system intrinsically depends on plastics. Uh, whether you're growing crops in greenhouses, under mulches, the losses that take place on the way from the farm to the fork. So we can't live with it. We can't live our modern life without plastic. And I hope, you know, just, just one thing, that over the next couple of days, you think about every time you touch a piece of plastic, you think about me, right? <laughs> because there'll be very few waking moments when you're not thinking about me. And that's how embedded this stuff is in your life. So what we need to do is cure the disease, not treat the symptoms. We need a new plastic system that incentivizes reuse. When we can't reuse the material anymore, recycling of durable plastics, polyethylene, polypropylene, the things people love to hate. And we need to plug the gaps and not legitimize a throwaway culture that uses degradable polymers. And it will be inconvenient and expensive because the inconvenient truth is that we are choking on convenience because the thing that these materials allow us to have is the ultimate convenience of being able to buy food and drink wherever we like, whenever we like, and throw the packaging away. So this is, um, this is the bag that's in my rucksack in case I have to do some shopping. It's made from a recycled sari. Um, this is a week's lunches. Yeah, I went to co-op, bought a load of fruit, um, unpacked it, and none of the packaging would go in the University of Sheffield recycling bin. Uh, so I took it back to the co-op. They weren't very happy about that. Okay. Since Plastic Planet, actually, that's changed. Now there's front of store collection. And actually, we're making building materials uh, from front-of-store collection plastic, mixed recycled plastic. Um, and, and in fact, in Jordan, 95% um, of the wood in, in, in Jordan as a building material is imported. Um, they make four times as much plastic waste, and we can replace nearly all of the wood uh, with recycled plastic, and they have no current recycling scheme. Uh, so we're working with Dow Chemicals and the Jordanian government and the UN uh, to deliver that. But some packaging's really good, right? So you, you buy a cucumber. Um, I've done this experiment at home, wasn't very popular. Bought two cucumbers, took one out of the packaging, left one in the packaging, took them out of the fridge every day, took a photograph of them. Um, after two weeks, the cucumber in the polythene was in perfectly good condition, still quite crisp and edible. After five days, the cucumber that wasn't, that was taken out of the um, polyth polythene packaging uh, was mush and was leaking things over the salad tray. <laughs> and, uh, and my wife told me I had to stop the experiment. <laughs> but there's a campaign to stop doing this. 
to stop doing these kinds of things that prevent food waste, and food waste is a big issue uh, for the UK economy and bigger around the world, uh, based on this gut reaction to we must go plastic free. There's a, there's a shop in London, a budgeon shop that has a plastic free aisle. Um, when you go through all the, all the alternative packaging they've introduced, its carbon footprint is four times higher than the corresponding aisle with the plastic in. And the reason is that if you substitute the packaging, um, then the weight increases from 50, 16 tons to 70 tons. Um, the energy use goes is from 1,400 megajoules to 2,400 megajoules, um, and the global warming potential goes from 59 metric tons of CO2 equivalent to 134. Why? Well, it's kind of clearly illustrated by the number of vans delivering the carrier bags. Okay, so you need eight vans um, to, sorry, you need one van to deliver the plastic carrier bags and seven vans to deliver the same number of paper carrier bags. And if you want a good metric for how bad something is, to a, to a factor of two or three, just weigh it. But there are some things that we've become used to uh, where the products co-evolved with the packaging, right? So modern snack foods didn't exist in the form we know them now. You can buy things, you can buy cheesy Watsits with a shelf life of a year, right? Now, when I was a kid, crisps came in a packet with a little blue packet of salt, and the marketeers sold, sold you, the packet of salt was there so you could shake it over the crisps. <laughs> no, it wasn't. The packet of salt was there to absorb the water to stop the crisps going soggy so they could have a shelf life of a month, okay? But these materials that have a thin layer of aluminium on PET have such a good gas barrier that you can have snack foods that have a shelf life of a year and the packs are filled with nitrogen so that the fat doesn't go rancid on contact with the oxygen. Right? It's really technologically brilliant and a whole range of new products have evolved. So one of the things we do to understand the, the balances are, are life cycle assessments. So our early training for physics students was um, we asked them to calculate the embedded energy in a cup of tea. Okay. So, so I, I'm a chemistry professor. I teach thermodynamics. So I made a guess that 80% of the energy embedded in a cup of tea uh, was boiling the water because water's got a very high heat capacity. Um, and I would have been right if we'd had black tea, right? But if you have a cup of tea with milk and one sugar, then they did everything. They kind of calculated all the energies. Yeah, there's 900 joules in the tea. There's 14 kilojoules in the paper that makes the tea bag. There's um, 66 kilojoules in the sugar, and there's 54 kilojoules in the milk, 260 joules in the bag manufacture. Uh, they used an 80th of the, of the box, transported the tea, and sugar, tea by sea and the sugar by road, and then they boiled the water. Total embedded energy, 150 kilojoules. Heating the water is 44%. The tea and the sugar is 20%, so I would have been right until we added the milk. 10 millilitres of milk in a 200 millilitre cup of tea is 36% of the energy. Because dairy is really, really energy intensive. And that's without the greenhouse gases that the cows emit being factored in. Okay? And dairy really works when you have a population of 200 million human beings. In fact, dairy was, dairy was the first money, right? It was the first thing that communities traded in the form of butter. Because butter is the most energy-dense food we eat. Pretty much unless you drink vegetable oil. <laughs> so butter has the same energy density as coal. 
not far off diesel. And it's the, it's the least difficult way of transporting the basic human need for food calories. And then a whole culture evolved around that that now has approaching 10 billion people. So if you want to be really good to the environment, become a vegan, right? And make your last meat meal your pet. <laughs> because, because running a Labrador is about the same as driving 12,000 miles a year in a diesel car. <laughs> it's actually only, um, it's only a quarter of the carbon emissions of running another child, but even I wouldn't say, make your last meat meal your last <laughs> child. So how about this beauty from a life cycle, life cycle analysis? So I go to a dinner party, and, um, and ooh, don't want Buxton water, really bad for the environment. Badwars, much, much less greenhouse emissions in Sheffield. Right, look of surprise, okay? I'll unpack that. So, um, the transport costs are very different, but small, compared to the cost of blowing the bottle. It's actually turning the thing that looks like a little test tube into a PET bottle. So if you notice, um, even this, um, this is an American bottled water bottle. This is a British bottled water bottle. The lids are the same size. And they get delivered to the factory as a little test tube with the, with the thread already molded in. And then they're grabbed by a machine that heats up the bottom of the test tube, then puts it into another machine that blows it up. So it has to get up to 150 degrees centigrade, and then there's high pressure to expand it, and then you have to get the heat out of it so there's cooling water as well. And it turns out that in a bottle of mineral water, uh, depending on where it's come from, but nearly 60% of the energy is blowing the bottle. Okay. Buxton water, 95% fossil energy. Badwa water, 80% nuclear energy. Okay. So the carbon emissions of the Badwa water are far less than the carbon emissions of the Buxton water. Consequently, I'm a bad woman. <laughs> I do this calculation to illustrate how complex the issues are, right? When you do the calculations, you find out some really perverse things. I am an advocate for nuclear power compared to CO2 emissions. Oh, I thought I'd get more of a reaction for that. <laughs> okay, you're all good people, that's okay. Um, but I'd, I really don't drink fizzy water. In fact, I really try and avoid bottled water as much as I can. So you can buy, and this is, um, I brought my own bottle, right? So this is the most egregious example of bottled water there is. Um, it's called Dasani. Um, I think I, I bought it in New York, so it's most likely New Jersey tap water, okay? That's all it is, it's tap water. And it's in a bottle, and the bottle's labeled plant bottle. Um, I mean, the funniest thing is, it even, ha even has a best before date. <laughs> water. Okay, it's been sterilized by UV, it's been through a, um, a carbon filter, it's not reverse osmosis water. And um, there's a big green sign here that says plant bottle. Yeah, it's up on the screen there. Um, if you read the detail, it says up to 30% plant material, but it's labeled as a plant bottle. And it's 100% recyclable. That's because it's made out of polyethylene terephthalate. It is a PET bottle. The up to 30% is polyethylene terephthalate is made by reacting ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid. And ethylene glycol is 30% of the weight of the terephthalic acid. That's where the 30 comes from. Um, 
and the up to is it might not have more than a couple of percent of it in. Um, the ethylene glycol is made by fermentation of food grade um, starch in Indonesia, is shipped to Spain uh, or Turkey where it's converted into PET. It's then made into little capsules to become PET bottles and shipped somewhere else in the world. This is a lie upon a lie upon a lie upon a lie and it's the best-selling brand of mineral water in the US. You got these today, Harrogate water. This is Harrogate tap water. Okay, the owner's spring, but the spring doesn't produce enough. But because it's Harrogate water, it's Harrogate spring water. Doesn't have to come from the spring. Okay, this is Peckham spring essentially. For those of you who remember only fools and horses. Um, I do like these bottles though because they are made from, it says on the bottle, made from 50% recycled PET. And if you look at the top of the bottle, it's kind of beige, uh, which is why recycled PET, you can't really get 100% recycled PET bottles because uh, they are discolored. And if you do the life cycle analysis, and I'm gonna show you some detail now. So, so this guy, Tim Smith and his coworkers, um, did a life cycle analysis. In fact, Tim Smith most likely did nothing and these two people did the life cycle analysis. Um, they did a comparative life cycle analysis of fossil and bio-based polyethylene terephthalate bottles. So when you do an LCA, what you do is you have to draw a boundary around the system. So they take biomass, turn it into isobutanol um, somehow, and then there's kind of three methods, three chemical reactions that take place to make paraxylene, and then paraxylene is turned into terephthalic acid. Or you take biomass, make ethanol, um, dehydrate that to make ethylene, oxidize it to make ethylene oxide, ox and then hydrate it to make uh, ethylene glycol. Then you have terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol, you can make PET. You treat that again to make bottle grade PET, and then you make a bottle. So each, each set of graphs is some environmental impact, okay? And along the, bottle, along the bottom is fossil-based terephthalic acid, wood-based terephthalic acid, or corn stover-based terephthalic acid. So this is, this is waste wood from timber processing. Uh, corn stover is the thing that's left after you harvest the corn. Um, and then the bars are fossil ethylene glycol, corn ethylene glycol, uh, switchgrass, which is a, a, a fast growing grass that's used to generate biomass uh, to make ethanol for fuel. Um, and then wheat straw, so again, an agricultural waste. So in this bottom corner is fossil fossil. Okay. Doesn't matter which way around you do it, fossil fossil always has a lower environmental impact than any of the biomass derived precursors for PET. Why? Well, the answer is here. You're making a plastic, which is a petrochemical. So first, you have to turn the biomass into oil, right? And to turn the biomass into oil needs energy. And that energy comes from burning oil. <laughs> okay? So you take plants, you turn them into oil by burning oil, and then you make a plastic. Consequently, that plastic is worse for the environment in every metric, apart from the particulates that you avoid by burning the wood or burning the straw. It's always worse. So I've done, and, and I'm, well, I'm not ashamed to say because I thought it was a good idea. I've done all sorts of research on, on using non-oil sources to make plastics, to make what's called PEF uh, after the furan, the five-membered ring here, um, to replace PET. And you can make a perfectly good bottle from corn, from sugar, from agricultural waste. Um, 
there's 20 million tons of PET bottles produced in a year. Um, you could replace all of that with this material. Um, you couldn't recycle it with PET because it ruins it. So if you've got two PEF bottles in 1,000 PET bottles, the PET wouldn't be recyclable anymore. Um, if you're growing corn or sugar beet to make it, it consumes more land, more water, and produces greenhouse gases. It's bonkers. So should we burn more oil to make bioplastics? Of course not. Four or five percent goes into making, of oil and gas goes into making plastics. And we can do that for a long time if we treat the plastic as a feedstock for petrochemicals. It never needs to leave the system. So yeah, we should make polymers from renewable resources if the life cycle analysis says it's the right thing to do. But you absolutely have to do the life cycle analysis. And doing this only makes sense when we've decarbonized the energy system, where all those energy inputs can be renewable energy inputs and not fossil energy inputs. And there'll always be enough fossil carbon to use as a chemical feedstock. We just need to stop burning it. Of course, geology's done most of the processing, right? Um, so why burn even more? So what should we do about plastic? Reuse, recycle, recover. The mantra. Okay? And we should do it with durable plastics. And why don't we reuse or refill anymore? Because it costs us all money. So the milkman's coming back. Okay? Uh, this is a, a thing called loop. Uh, it was reported by CNN, fake news again. Um, so CNN uh, reported that Loop will deliver to your home various products from well-known companies um, and you use the products and send the packaging back and they refill. Um, Waitrose, as we saw earlier, have started a packaging free option and in Sheffield we have a great milk person, uh, our cow Molly, and our cow Molly supplies all the milk to the University of Sheffield um, and we've just taken out uh, 28,000 of these two pint PET bottle, polyethylene bottles um, and replaced them with churns, with steel churns. And now all the cafes at the University of Sheffield are getting their milk in steel churns and we don't have any polyethylene waste anymore. And, and Eddie, who runs our cow Molly, loves it um, because he doesn't have to buy all those polyethylene bottles. Um, we have a milk delivery at our house, right? Um, milk gets delivered, I'm trying to wean us off of milk not succeeding so far, um, but we pay twice the price that you pay for milk uh, in polyethylene because it's better for the environment. And do you know what? It gives a milkman a job, right? The thing about single use is it's stripped out all sorts of costs by stripping out all sorts of people. So drinks manufacturers and retailers really don't want to deal with collecting bottles and refilling them. Because that costs money. People have to do it. So these, these are all bottles from Germany. I couldn't bring one with me, okay? Um, because uh, when, I go, when I do go to Germany, I always buy a couple of bottles of Coke. Um, I generally buy one in a brand new bottle, and I buy one in a completely scuffed up, disgusting looking bottle. Right, because you pay a 25 cent deposit on a Coke bottle in Germany. And when you take the Coke bottle back, you get your deposit back. And so the um, security guard wasn't right impressed, but I emptied a fridge to try and do the statistics of how many times they went through. So counting the pristine bottles versus the scuffed ones. So they go through about 25, 30 times. Um, brought some home, used them for conversation and teaching purposes. Um, one Friday evening, went home, left them on the table in my office. When I came in Monday morning, cleaner had done the right thing, put them in the recycling. Don't have them anymore. Um, last time I went to Germany, I, I bought two more bottles. Didn't take them out of the van when I got home. Wife did the right thing, put them in the recycling. <laughs> Didn't even get out of the van. 
right? That caused a bit of marital stress. Um, mainly because I hadn't cleaned the van, by the way. <laughs> which I should have done. Um, and then here, this is, these are Pennsylvania milk crates, right? So the land of the free, the home of the brave, there's a $300 fine for the unauthorized use of milk crates. Yeah, like filling them full of recycling. Why? US, $300 fine for abusing a milk crate. And the reason is that if you're going to have a system that has reuse and refill, you have to have an enormous inventory. You have to have capital locked up in packaging. And it ruins the bottom line. So when I went to Unilever and talked to them about refillable shampoo bottles with a deposit, and even worse, only having four kinds of bottles for the whole of Unilever's range, and doing all the marketing on the label that was stuck on with a water-soluble adhesive, the finance director said to the research director, why did you bring this idiot in? Uh, it's, complete, it's incomprehensible, but we know it's the right thing to do. And then these five guys, and I'm, I'm, I'm run out of time. So these five guys, what they're doing, stood outside the pub, okay? So one of the things we're trying to work out is how can we get behavior change to happen? What nudges can we think of? So the Kyoto Agreement got rid of C CFCs in the main because the ozone layer was easy to see, and plastic is easy to see, right? Um, so these five guys are stood outside the pub having a smoke because it's socially unacceptable to smoke in the pub. But what are they doing stood outside the pub? Well, actually, the three bank robbers, and they're planning their next bank robbery, okay? Perfectly acceptable to rob a bank. We make movies about those great old guys who broke into the safe deposit boxes. But criminals won't smoke in the pub. So one of the things we're trying to understand in our research is how can we access these kinds of behavior changes to drive a behavior change around plastics use? So currently there's a high fat, high sugar diet shift. People are shifting away from low fat diets to low sugar diets. Um, but our resistance to evidence is legion. So what about medical plastics? So, a chest pain is your body saying, call 999. Uh, one of the guys who works on my grant is Alex Rothman. He's a clinical lecturer in cardiology. And he, he fits stents, so there's a, there's a bit of um, cardiovascular uh, problem here. Um, he goes in and puts a balloon in um, via some really complicated surgery and then leaves the stent behind and the pathways reopened, and the infarctions repaired. That's how much plastic he uses in doing that. All of it thrown away. So, can we improve the materials? If we do, can we incorporate them into production lines? What policies do we have to do to incentivize a change away from just throwing everything away at the end of any, every intervention. There's lots of regulation, so it's a very different problem to the problem that we face in packaging. Um, and there are social problems. You know, would you really want a second-hand catheter? Right? You know, there are, there are some real issues here. So I knew, I knew I could come to this meeting without getting a medical prop, right? I could just walk in and collect one of these from a rep, okay? So you generate 600,000 tons of waste every year, and 85% of it's non-hazardous, and therefore potentially recyclable. But it just goes to landfill or incineration. Less than 10% of NHS waste is recycled. And coffee cups, 
from hospitals don't get recycled. Past PET bottles from hospitals often don't get recycled because they've come from a hospital. So, oh, I, I did astound the, um, the rep by going, oh yeah, PMMA, <laughs> polypropylene, PVC, okay. Uh, the, the, your teeth are really, really sensitive to hardness of things. And 40 years of experience of plastics men, means I can pretty much characterize the materials by biting them. Um, <laughs> It, it has got me into trouble uh, in the past. Um, especially when I was in Ulster and I went to have a really good look at the composite on the uh, police van. Um, so you, you throw away 133,000 tonnes of plastic every year. Um, you use more, P, more PVC than any other sector. Um, basically, because of a combination of inertia and regulation. So what's past stays, even if there are massive improvements in materials. Um, so so the, the, the Jackson Reese who invented pieces of anaesthetic equipment would recognize them today because they were qualified and have remained in use made out of PVC. Uh, the last known use of one of his was in a hooker pipe he sent me uh, that he'd found in Tunisia. So there we go. So, so you use all sorts of, of really bad materials um, and easily recycled materials. So you, you, there's more waste plastic in your waste stream than most industries. Um, and the bag system's part of the problem, right? So, so there's, there's very um, clear segregation, domestic waste, offensive waste, clinical waste, and the red bag uh, hazardous waste. 59% um, of your waste is in this region, but very little of it ends up being recycled. 33% is in the uh, incineration or landfill, and 8% is in the absolutely has to be incinerated. About 50% of medical waste is misclassified. And even though it can be still used for treatment or could be recycled, it isn't. Out of habit. Habit reinforced by regulation, but out of habit. So the regulations that you have to destroy the red things and incinerate them are absolutely right, and no one would want to change that. But surely... We don't have to have so much single-use material. Surely we can think of areas where sterilization to render something hygienic enough to use again could be derived, devised. The manufacturers, they don't want you to reuse things. They sell more shit, right? That's the whole point. It drives sales. And if you, if you manufacture something that could be sterilized, you get a whole load of extra costs to label it reusable and have your own in-house sterilization validation system. So there's no incentive for the manufacturers to help you be more reusable. And then there's all sorts of institutional and logistical problems. The finance director of the hospital won't want you to do anything that increase costs, ever. Right? So you're, never going to, you're going to have to push really, really hard to recycle. And you'd need to redesign the waste management system to facilitate recycling rather than disposable. Um, but there are really simple things you can do, just by the way you organize the bins. So you, have to go, you know, so you have to go past the recycled bin until you get to the red bin. You have to go down the cascade just to make it a bit more difficult to dispose. And then there's the culture. Um, often all waste from an operation is regarded as infectious, even though lots of it's packaging that's never been anywhere near a patient and maybe hasn't even made it into the operating theater. 65% um, of operating room waste could be avoided by replacing disposable items with reusables. 
57% of operating staff aren't clear about what can be recycled and what can't. Therefore, it all goes into waste. There are things happening, and we want to help them happen. So, so I have a couple of people working with um, polymer experts, scientists and engineers, social scientists, environmental scientists, political scientists, to understand the issues. And we're doing a proof of concept study on medical plastics. So we're going to look at packaging, um, how the packages are designed, what the packages mean in terms of how you make a, a product such that you can sterilize it and still inspect it. So there's often two materials, if not three, which means you can't recycle them. Um, the medical waste containers, often half of the weight of the medical waste is the container that it's put in, that gets burned. So there must be, there's a really easy win here uh, that we're looking at. And then there's all the single-use things. Um, pill bottles, do they have to be single-use? Of course not. Um, you need to worry about what kind of plastic and when and how it's going to be cleaned and how it's going to be sterilized, but we have the technical capacity to do that. Um, blister packs, they're, they're a terrible waste. Far easier to put things in a glass bottle you could take back to the chemist and get refilled. But it's not convenient. And it costs more. It takes the pharmacists longer. So we need more pharmacists, right? We need more staff. We give people jobs. There's, there are massive opportunities here to, to regenerate the economy, not just in your field, but in every field, by changing the way we deal with materials and weaning ourselves off of convenience. And we reckon we can save the NHS 5 million a year just by reducing the amount of infectious waste classification. Just by making less go in the red bin. And if you implement measures to prevent the generation of those materials by improving waste segregation, you could save an order of magnitude more. There are big savings to be had, real savings to be had, by dealing with medical waste properly and not just chucking it in the bin, whichever bin that might be. So we're going to look at medical packaging. We'll look at designing things that can be, that are from a single material that would allow them to be recycled and at the same time sterilized. Uh, an easy win medical waste containers uh, so that we're burning less plastic in order to burn what needs to be burned. Um, and then going back to reusable things. So, so I understand when you look down someone's throat, what's that called? What's that device called? Laryngoscope. So laryngoscopes used to be made out of metal, right? You could sterilize them and reuse them. Now they have an integral torch in some cases. So there's a battery and a light bulb and a laryngoscope that gets used once. And which bin does it go in? The red one? Right? Completely and utterly wasteful of resource. So, um, plastic sustainability. Well, you have to walk the talk. Uh, I've tried to show you some of that. I went to Leicester this morning for a nine o'clock meeting. My breakfast was wrapped in this. Right? It's, um, it's called a wrap wrap. Okay? It's got a piece of Velcro here and a piece of Velcro here. Uh, my daughter Gemma, I, made a, I make her lunch most days. Uh, she likes her wrap, so I wrap it in cling film. She said, Dad, um, can you use aluminium foil? Because it's much better for the environment. I've read it on the internet. So I did. And then I, then I did the calculation. Okay. Um, you'd need to use the aluminium foil 200 times to get ahead of using a, piece, a new piece of cling film every time. So I told her that. 
So she said, well, well we can try. Uh, after a week, <laughs> she wanted the cling film back. Um, so then I bought, I bought these. So the, this is made out of the same material as cling film. It's just 70 times thicker. So you have to use it 70 times um, to get ahead. I started marking it with a Sharpie, um, but it, it rubs off. Um, but this, this, is, this is a two-year-old sandwich wrap. This is great. Had my cup of coffee in this this morning. It's a pink cup that goes in my handbag. Collapses down. So, whoops. Doesn't take up too much room in your bag. Everyone on the train's intrigued and I get to call out the amount of plastic waste they've had with their breakfast. So, I, don't, I do try and live it. Um, can we beat the fossil alternative? Very rarely. Oil's really good as a petrochemical resource and absolutely terrible as a fuel. So let's stop burning it. Especially, let's stop burning it to make plastics out of plants. Um, I'm all for a circular economy, and, and that's essentially where my research is going. But we have to get the energy decarbonized first. And in order to do that, consumers and policymakers need to work together. So one of the things we're proposing is a reduced materials set. We actually want to make some materials illegal, right? So you can only use three plastics, polyethylene, polypropylene, and PET for packaging. Then the plastics waste problem would disappear because if you made everything have a deposit, there'd be no waste plastic. Go to a festival, right? There's never any of those plastic glasses laid around. There's all sorts of other waste, but never any plastic glasses because you can get 10 pence for taking one back to a bar. So they get picked up. Even if you don't want to collect the deposit, somebody else will. So the other trial we're going to run um, is a, a returnable crisp packet. So actually you get your crisps in a Tupperware box, pay a deposit for the Tupperware box, and get your deposit back when you go back to the shop. So limited material sets and reuse deposits and refills will cut profits but improve the plastic system. And that's my campaign. And I want you, as medical practitioners, to think about how plastics work in your field. And if you can help me, please do. Thank you very much.